And you see <laughs> that ripeness turned into a decay. Like a good banana. <laughs> yep. <laughs> This is a Nexus Special, episode 63, New Year's Eve, 2018, on December 30th, 2018. And now, you mean the x right? This Nexus Special is hosted by Brian Mitchell, Ryan Rampersad, and Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ns63. That was a great title. Thanks for reading that one, Ian. <laughs> Good work, oh, Ian. I read it? Good to know. Of course you read it. <laughs> from the future in the past <laughs> so 2018 is coming to a close here uh was it a good year great year huge year big week it was a year it was a year yeah um it's so funny when we get to these and i'm you know i'm always like so what what did happen this year and i have to go and back and like look at news articles and everything and i don't know i always come away from it like kind of down I don't know. I always come away with it. I should have had a list going through the, the whole year, and I didn't again. <laughs> That's a good point. Maybe we I mean, should, I've tried. You know what? Yeah, let's make next year's document, the show notes for next year's year-end special, right now, and we'll I agree. just put stuff. How many into days it. into 2019 will we be before we forget to keep adding to it? Uh, <laughs> about the seventh of January. Yeah. 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 Fair. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm sure accurate. that CES will come and go, and we'll be like, what was? I, what even happened? I was, don't know. Is there one plan for 2019? We'll find out on the 8th. <laughs> well, CES isn't important for the industry anymore, so like that doesn't matter. True, true. How things change. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. So one of the things that I was kind of surprised about this year was like, oh my gosh, Meltdown and Spectre was actually during 2018. It feels like it was so long ago, but that was in January. Yep. Yeah, geez, lots happened this year. And I'm pretty sure everything is still vulnerable, so watch out. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that I've gotten, like, software updates to various devices that told me that they, like, solved the, the meltdown problem and stuff, but, like, At I don't the know. expense of your very, very valued performance. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of that was performance reducing, right? Yep. Yeah, because it, it, we're no longer able to take advantage of a lot of the... Um, uh, what's it called? Where it, it speculative, speculative uh, execution. Yep. 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 Um, also, this year, I think it was WannaCry. Maybe it was not Petya, but the uh, the the hack that Russia put in Ukraine that then spread everywhere in the world for all the ransomware attacks and took down tons and tons of stuff. Like Maersk shipping out of Denmark was one of the huge companies hit shut mm. down shipping for a number of days, and I think. I read a great article. I wish I still had a link to it somewhere um, where they were only able to recover their entire active directory um, configuration because there was um, one server in Africa that had been offline for a week and it had, <laughs> they had someone fly to Africa and meet at another airport in a different country to pick up the hard drive and bring it back to, I think the UK, they did a lot of the, the recovery efforts in. I hope they made a clone nuts. of it before they flew out because wow, that's, that's risky. Hopefully. Yeah. I don't and know. That's so, why you have backed up redundancy and not just parallel redundancy. You know, I think I think in a situation like that, like it might have almost been better for them not to be able to restore because maybe don't use AD <laughs> Teach them a lesson. and maybe don't use Microsoft garbage and I don't know, like use a real system. Don't tell that to my company. Uh, there was another big hack of some big U.S. company that started with an E and I'm pretty it had sure to that do was with every one of them. Pretty sure. Well, sure. It was that social social security one or something, right? That's where all the it was experience, like, two hundred right? million numbers. Experience, yeah. Uh, I think I don't remember. I'm, it's the um, credit what, credit score company. That one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, pretty sure that's experience. Okay, that was Equif- pretty bad. Equifax, you guys. Okay, e- that's it. Equifax. <laughs> Starts We're with terrible. A okay, so is Experian also one of them? I have no idea. I've never heard of that. <laughs> I've heard of it. I don't know. It has to be one of them. It is. It exists for a reason. Consumer reporting agency company. I don't know. I. And so. How like, does money? And so, like that hack happened, and it exposed all sorts of great data to somebody to somewhere, and nothing happened because of it. Like nothing happened, and their stock is up higher than ever. Yeah, like the industry is so <laughs> stacked against malicious 
hackings that it doesn't matter for the most part. Yeah. Um, and I've I've even seen inside of business the 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 reluctance of doing certain things has decreased because well when we get hacked I guess nobody will notice or if they do notice it won't matter for more than a week and oh well. There's no accountability. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even even like these companies where their CEOs had to go and like speak in front of Congress or whatever, and it's like, okay, but what happened as a result of that? Nothing. I mean, nothing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So what can you do to keep yourself protected online? Well, we've got an entire episode of The Extra Dimension about that. But to start off, you have to move to Europe. <laughs> yeah, because yes. Europe now has the GDPR. That was That was a big one this year. Yeah, new laws like regulating how companies have to treat all of the information that they collect about their users. Uh, and I like, I mean, I like the law. And I also like the fact that um, even though it's technically only applies to like people who live in Europe, we live in this world where like laws that are, you know, created and passed in in one area, if that area is large enough and economically like important enough, then those laws essentially like apply worldwide because it's just too difficult to like, you know, apply different uh types of 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 like user agreements to people in different parts of the world. Um did I say that I like that? That actually makes me really nervous. So I think the other part with GDPR that we don't know about yet is how will it be enforced? So mm-hmm. it the law is in effect now, and the regulations are the regulators are still catching up to apply the regulations now. So you know maybe by twenty twenty we'll actually have some understanding of what is enforceable and what will companies simply just ignore within that law. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious to see if if Europe just attacks Facebook for their inherent tracking. I'm I'm very curious to see what happens there. Yeah. 2020 seems like it's so far away, but like it's only a year away. Yep. That's so crazy. Time. <laughs> well, it'll 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 seem much closer to you Ian next year when you're reading through the list of all the great events of 2019 in mm-hmm. our new doc. <laughs> yep. Um I've noticed this year that like a lot of online platforms are converging and like they seem a lot more similar to each other than they used to so like pretty much everybody has stories nowadays i don't even I think know what except, that is i think except for twitter twitter is the only one that i can think of that doesn't have stories are you sure um yeah yeah there's facebook has stories instagram has stories snapchat has stories what is what YouTube is what na- is stories.twitter.com well, here's the funny thing about it, right? Is a lot of times these stories are not available on the web platform. They're only available in the mobile apps for these platforms. Twitter so, Twitter has it. Sorry, not, yeah, not Twitter. Instagram has it in their web app. Uh, Facebook has it in their web app, at least on mm-hmm. mobile. Yeah. YouTube doesn't, though. YouTube, it's only available in the mobile app. Oh, yeah. yeah. YouTube has it, too. Um, but then also like on the flip side, Instagram and Facebook are now like kind of pushing long form video more than they used to. So like they're kind of trying to compete with YouTube on YouTube's terms and YouTube is trying to compete with them on their terms. It's very strange. Um, Tumblr is banning adult content now. So like, I mean, that, that was kind of the, the unique thing about Tumblr for, for most of its existence now has just been like, how like like the the openness the freedom of the community there um as compared to a lot of other platforms and they're you know they're just gutting themselves by getting rid of that i think they're like their number of active users like halved or something over yeah yeah and this leads into the next thing that i wrote down which is that people seem to be getting more and more fed up with centralized platforms. Um, We had uh, more information about the Cambridge Analytica scandal came to light uh, this year. People became more aware than they used to be of like the rampant location tracking that apps on your phone are up to. Um, I've noticed several prominent celebrities, and when I say prominent celebrities, I'm talking about within the spheres that I follow. (laughs) 
but like several several people have decided to like take a break from their use of the social internet or like at least you know drastically scaling back um so in particular i'm thinking about like will wheaton and cgp gray and john green um and so it's just like this there's this kind of zeitgeist of like oh wait maybe maybe these giant centralized platforms that we threw our lives into uh aren't as great as we thought they were yeah yeah now at the same time i do think people are fed up with it but it is such a part of our culture now that it's going to take a lot more than just more and more privacy things for people to leave. Like, you know, leaving Facebook is more of an inconvenience than a benefit today. I think for most people, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like no matter how meticulous I am about maintaining my, my contacts list, right. And having it as complete as possible. And like, there's still no, way for me to have like the email addresses of everybody who i'm connected to on facebook but do you want them i really do ryan i want all that data why do you want all that data why are you pretending to be google so that i can email people what i want to email people just email them at their username at facebook.com that doesn't exist anymore oh it doesn't no they took that out oh it it was too useful i never used it (laughs) <laughs> uh yeah Clearly, I, I, super useful. like i used to think think the same way and like i thought yeah well i don't know any of these people uh, outside of facebook so i'm just gonna use facebook as that contact list that's great but i also realized i don't care because all those people if they need to find me they can google me like a normal person sure but what if you need to find them why would i ever need that <laughs> and if i can't You'd google them, if i can't google them they don't exist like they don't they can't possibly be relevant at this very moment and if they don't have linkedin they have almost no professional setting that i would need to contact them in so i feel like that's okay like it's not a big deal i'm thinking mostly about family oh, i don't like talk to them. my my extended family i you know they they have a a like group chat going oh, I, on facebook I don't, I don't that, like you know facebook. Because that's, like, the only platform that everybody can agree on, even though, like, we clearly all have email addresses. Ah, I'm so mad. I'm so mad about it. it For me, a lot it. of it is... You need to be madder. Facebook Messenger and, like, events. A lot of, like, yeah. concerts and stuff I go to, I find because of Facebook. And, you know, random things that people I'm not, like, super duper close with might invite me to. That's where I'm... Where the, er, that's where it all is. Yeah. I also, like... I'm also frustrated with how many groups I'm a part of in facebook that i am very very invested in but like there's no way to access them other than through my facebook account so that's those are the two main things that um that i haven't been able to figure out how to replace sans facebook i i did it all by just stopping (laughs) just it's done i did delete the facebook app from my phone and i just have the web app bookmarked on my home screen which means i just don't get notifications and i lose on probably some tracking but that doesn't hasn't really been a problem. There's been nothing super urgent, and I find that if I just check it once or twice a day, or even every other day, it's fine. Do you still get notifications sent to your email? No, I've never, I've, I've never had that enabled. Yeah, I had, I had Facebook notifications turned on through the web app for quite a while, and earlier this year, I actually just turned that off because I decided that I didn't care. Good try. iOS, I don't think Keep lets going. you do web-based notifications, and that, that's a shame. I've never, I've like since day one signing up for Twitter and for Facebook, I've said turn off all email notifications, and that's how my email notifications are so low. Yep. Uh, there were a couple of gene edited babies born this year, and so cue all of the Gattaca references in the world. Hmm, uh, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, whether or not you you think that gene editing babies is going to be okay or or if it's the plague right i think we can all agree that the way that the 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 scientist who did this went about it was not good because he didn't really disclose to the parents of these children like what exactly he was doing uh what methods he was using and of course like nobody else in the scientific community knew that anything was happening until after these children were born so yeah this whole this whole event has been tainted by 
his approach to it. So what's the backstory to this? I don't really remember seeing much about this and when and what, where, who, why. So this happened in China. <laughs> um, I don't remember the scientist's name, but um, he he edited the genes uh, of these babies using CRISPR. Uh, and specifically, he was doing it to make them, to give them more like HIV resistant genes uh, because their father is HIV positive, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's another thing about this is that like, um, we, like medically, we have a lot of ways uh, to, to prevent children from getting HIV if the, one of their parents has it. You know, so like that, it wasn't a, he, he wasn't suddenly coming up with a solution to this problem. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know, there, there were already solutions. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then this last one, actually, I'm a huge fan of this one. Um, the kilogram has now been redefined to be based on Planck's constant instead of being based on an arbitrary hunk of metal housed in France. So... This is fantastic because Planck's constant is a universal constant, so like the the kilogram will never ever change, right? You know, it's like we we can't have uh you know like a, a piece of metal accidentally getting stuff shaved off of it or just you know like eroding over time a little bit and have like that the universal definition of a kilogram changing anymore. Um, now now it'll be nice and and constant and everybody in the universe no matter how far out we spread as a as a human race uh everybody will be able to figure out exactly the same weight measurement system based on measuring this universal constant cool i like it yeah kind of similar to how i believe the meter was redefined to be like how far light travels in however much time right yeah so now i just i guess we just have to redefine time <laughs> time is the well time would be what the like based on half-life of nuclear things right sure yeah that could be unfortunately though i think you know time also uh changes based on how much gravity there is in the area space time yeah all right we should get into some tech stuff yeah do you want to start with google I guess I'll start us off with Google because I love Google so much. Um, so, yeah, Google's... Oh, man. Google kills off a few of their products and they kill off my heart. Uh, Inbox is going away. Google Plus is going away. Hangouts is going away. Allo is going away. Yeah. Yeah. What? Kind of? What? What? Kind of? Kind of going away? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the consumer version of Hangouts is going away. And then it's going to get so. replaced with another consumer-ish version of hangouts eventually i don't know google just can't handle it yeah i don't know i mean it's ugh. the the thing that's making me most nervous about this is that like they haven't addressed like what what is gonna be the official replacement to this in a way that satisfies me you know well, because they're like they're not satisfying you that's the point <laughs> like the, the official replacement is supposed to be messages right now or whatever they renamed it to just a day ago yeah and it, so that they can like push this rcs thing which um, is a terrible choice because rcs is carrier based which was the yeah. whole point of going to an internet based chat system 10 years ago yeah yeah hmm. so what they what you know what they say right in you know what's old is new again oh yeah 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 mm-hmm. hi google reader hey Man, I still remember that very emotional blog post that I wrote when Google Reader's demise was announced. Oh, oh, it slayed me. Is that the right I term? Really, I don't. Is that think what kids say these I, days? I don't know what that means, but that's okay. It, it wrecked you. <laughs> it wrecked me. There you go. That's the right one. The, neither of those are okay. The meme life, Ryan. Come I, on. I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> what What were Google's employees protesting about? They there were a couple of things, uh, and I think both of these happened like late in the year, kind of fall into winter. Um, so the first thing was um, some information came to light about a I don't know if it was one executive or if there were multiple executives, um, but who were like accused of sexual misconduct, and then you know Google instead of just firing them outright, uh, you know encouraged them to 
retire and gave them you know large severance packages because they're executives and everything and so the the google employees were protesting this because of course like all employees should be treated equally when it comes to this kind of thing not you know not just based on like oh i you know if you're if you're an entry-level engineer like and you get accused of sexual misconduct yeah you're just gonna your butt's gonna get fired uh but if you're an executive you know you get a lot more leeway um and then the other thing that was uh being protested is dragonfly so this is uh reviving the the idea the that Google can have their products available in China. Specifically um, the search engine. Yes. Yeah. Well, because that's, yeah, Google's main product. Um, and the reason that, like, Google left China so long ago was because, like, China, the Chinese government was demanding that Google allow them to gather information about, you know, who's searching for things and what they're searching for, et cetera. And Google rightfully was said you know no we are not going to let you do that to our users um because that is you know a big privacy violation and uh and so yeah now now google is has been caught thinking about going back to china and um compromising those those ideals in order to do it Uh, and so a lot of employees were not happy about that and and a lot of the public was also not happy about that. Pretty oh much, yeah, pretty much nobody was happy about that. Well, um, Google kind of famously removed the "don't be evil" part of their mission statement a year, you know, a couple years ago, didn't they? They didn't remove it. They just put it lower down and took off the bold. Yeah, yeah, de-emphasized it at least significantly. Um, so like Google's actions throughout the year, like there's there's product incoherence, there's service mm-hmm. inconsistency, <laughs> there's Beloved services being shut down and left to die. There are services nobody cares about still going for some reason. Um, like uh, services being merged in weird and awkward ways. Yep. Um, like Google has some trouble from pretty much every direction at this point. Um, you know, it, it they're kind of becoming the Microsoft of about ten years ago. <laughs> and it's funny because here I am going, man. I've been using Google services for so long, but like. Man, do Microsoft services look kind of attractive at this point? Maybe I should give them a shot again. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I on the other hand, I I feel like you know if if Hangouts is really going to be dead, I could almost just get out of Gmail like pretty easily here, and I could just go and roll my own everything at this point because like at some point the, the, what Google's offering isn't as useful anymore if they're going to just keep turning stuff off and breaking stuff. Do you just are you saying that you're just going to? spin up your own smtp server and everything sure or i'll pay for it from somewhere else so speaking of microsoft they've done a few things this year too um i'll just say like as someone just kind of watching everything unfold over the last couple of years microsoft has become much more of an interesting company to watch um they're huge now contributor to open source uh, part of that they bought github um, so now it's under the microsoft umbrella um and which they, which freaked a lot of people out what right you know in the initial wake of of that acquisition yeah definitely i do think it's microsoft is a good company to own someone like github you know better microsoft than like anyone else i can think of i agree in the sense that it would be bad if ibm owned github but you know who <laughs> really should have owned github github should have owned github i don't like necessarily when companies buy other companies especially when they're basically successful. Like, GitHub didn't need to be purchased. They were fine. Yeah, that's true. One enterprise license is like $100,000 a year for a business. And it's not, I mean, like, I feel like that's a lot of money, but it isn't in the scope of things, I suppose. But GitHub was fine the way it was. I don't think we've seen the, I don't even think we've seen, like, the first, we, we haven't heard of, other than the purchase of GitHub, Microsoft hasn't done anything bad yet. Just, just wait. We will see. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, also in the Microsoft world, um, this you know happened in the last month or two, late in the year. Um, Microsoft Edge is going to sw- switch over to Chromium to, for use in its uh, rendering and JavaScript engines. Um, this caused a bit of uproar. I think it will allow Microsoft Edge to become a... Um, how should I phrase this? Just as ignored? Yes. 
yeah. and probably a more, little more modern in some ways. I think the Edge team would just couldn't keep up with all the the new features that Google and Mozilla and Apple have been putting in their browsers. Um, at least from personal experience, the developer tools in Edge are just still as terrible as they were in 2013 with IE11. So, you know, I, I, I read a lot about this on both sides of the divide. So like pro, pro Chrome and pro, pro Microsoft. And I don't understand why Microsoft being the company they are couldn't have had a bigger team to fix more of the things. That's that a very broken. good point. Yeah. I Not- think it's definitely a product management, um, director vision and kind of company priority problem versus, um, that they, you know, couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, I feel like there's got to be something deeper than that. I So in the old days, Internet Explorer was literally tied to the operating system. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. in, in 7 and, and beyond, they basically stopped doing those tie-ins because uh, there was this nice European Union that complained a lot and basically stopped it. But speaking of, the European Union did a similar thing to Android this year. Um, Google had to, like restructure the the licensing ways that like their their core suite of apps are are bundled in with with android right so there are cer- there's a certain class of utility in a in a software package that requires that it be changeable and like sort of interchangeable interoperable um and i guess i guess at some point microsoft just decided that they don't care anymore to even try i don't know i don't i totally i don't understand totally the cause of microsoft's edge deprecation here um do you think they'll change the name of it uh i feel like they changed it too recently so no Uh, do you think anybody Um, cares or knows knows that they did i mean i I wonder if anybody would know what's another uh, word that would have an e (laughs) so they don't have to change the logo drastically again yes right (laughs) uh maybe it could be equifax (laughs) okay (laughs) I did read um, an article the other day about kind of Microsoft's browsers over the years. Um, so a number of years ago, they basically dropped support for all versions of IE that so that so they basically looked at their operating systems and only supported the browsers, the most recent browser that would run in any of their supported operating systems, which basically dropped support in everything except for IE 11, which kind of killed. So instead of people. Um, well, and then they're only actively developing in Edge, and IE 11 is just getting security fixes. But instead of like migrating people to use Windows 10 and then Edge, it just said people just said, "Okay, I'm gonna use Chrome or something else," which just tanked their browser share. I think that was you can look at a graph from like 2016 to today, and um, between Edge and IE, their browser uh, market share is just tanked from like 18 to like 10 percent, 8 percent, kind of a thing. Yep. Um. And so I think that's part of it. So fewer and fewer people were using it. So and then prioritizing working on it inside of Microsoft, I think, was probably having issues. Who knows? At least that's what it looks like from the outside. Yeah, we'll see what happens with it. I I hope that they uh, make their Chrome version good. Yeah. Do you do you think it'll ever get to the point where Microsoft is is it you know the, a browser? is such low priority for them that they literally just bundle a different browser with the operating system instead of making their own. I mean, that's what they're doing. I mean, kind I, of, I mean, they're doing that with the rendering engine, but like, so do we know, you know if the can, JavaScript can, engine's also changing? Uh, yeah, I believe they're switching over to Chromium for everything. Okay. For, so they'll get, they'll get blank. They'll get yeah. V8. V, V8. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and, and now so, I did see that the, the web views inside of windows are still going to be on edge, edge HTML. Which is dumb, and, but and that's probably to... they can't probably do that 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 they probably can't change it yet. Yeah, that's a lot of work to change, and yeah. a lot of stuff that will probably break. Right, because <laughs> Microsoft. Um, yeah. I like in a way they are doing uh, a custom browser, a custom fork of Chrome for themselves. So Microsoft has a custom Android launcher, and so I would I would make oh, yeah. I would call this like the same kind of thing as that. And it comes uh, to the Mac. And it'll run on versions of Windows 7, 8.1, and 10. So they're expanding OS compatibility by a lot, probably because Chromium already compiles for that. So Right. Yep. So here's a question for, like, extensions. Do are, are 
Edge browser extensions, do those rely on the rendering engine or are those like, will they just inherit Google's extensions uh, ecosystem? Well, I don't think the store would be compatible necessarily. However, the extension mechanism is supposed to be universal. Okay. Though they, they could diverge from that too. That's, that's extensions run and connect to the page. So extension code could be pretty compatible, but how it interfaces with the browser itself could be less compatible but you know it's how they prioritize it i think but just curious how similar every time you right click on something and you open your context menu it'll say save to onedrive save to uh whatever other microsoft service there is i don't know any (laughs) but i'm sure there's more than one yeah all right well let's get on to our next company apple i've heard of them um yeah, they released a bunch of products this year. So they started with the HomePod in like last January or February. Nah, what a joke. Yeah, it was. I think it was supposed to launch earlier, but it didn't. It, they didn't come out with it until February of this year. Yeah, I think it was probably supposed to launch fall last year, so it could be in for Christmas. Um, now, uh, just a note on that: they launched it for three hundred fifty dollars. Um, for a lot of the holiday stuff, they had it on sale either th- Apple did or other sellers for two hundred fifty, and I think that's a much more reasonable price for it's it. It's still too much. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. 350 seems excessive 250 seems approachable it plays music i mean it has to do more than that yeah it's got a bunch of there's like, some speakers i got um smart light switch or smart outlets and another smart light so my whole apartment can be lit with just home kit control leds now um that means i need to use my phone or siri and a home pod would make it convenient i don't know what i'm gonna do when i get a roommate because especially if they don't have an iphone I, 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 I want I want I want Brian's roommate not to have an iPhone now. Like this will be amazing. I mean, this is one of the reasons that like my home is full of Chromecasts because like Everybody no matter what w- yeah, no matter what platform my housemates are on, they can still like cast stuff to to it unless they're using Apple Music. I can't cast uh overcast because Yeah, because Marco's ridiculous. No, because Google's ridiculous. I've, I've never wanted to cast a podcast like that is ridiculous. Oh, I love casting my podcast. It's so great. <sighs> so I heard uh, there was what new else iPad. would I do during breakfast? <laughs> I heard there was a new iPad. What, tell me about it. Uh, it's the sixth generation, so they say, but it's really like I don't know tenth or something. Um, <laughs> Counting, ninth, what's that? Eighth. You mean the X, right? <laughs> the X. <laughs> uh, this was introduced at their uh, uh, education event in Chicago last year, or was it? Was it New York? I think it was Chicago. And uh, it's $329 iPad. So it, it supports things like the crayon, but not the pencil. And the crayon. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? So it's they, have, the they crayon, have a different it's stylus? A lo- it's a Logitech stylus, but it's called the crayon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> and uh, it's a cheaper one, kind of built for education and for more entry-level stuff. And like for $329, it's not a bad deal. Um, jumping to June, they had WWDC 2018, where they previewed iOS 12 and macOS Mojave. Uh, they also uh, introduced Marzipan, their platform for running I- uh, UIKit applications on the Mac. So we'll definitely expect to see more of that next year. Um, they had new MacBook Pros come out this summer with lots of cores. So using Six the latest cores. Intel chips. Yeah, they're pretty powerful. I, and, I have and one. a slightly revised keyboard. Yeah, there, there's now a mesh membrane. That, Ooh, membrane. Or a silicone membrane that, yeah, makes it quieter. So they said, but also probably less crummy. Uh, this fall, the iPhone XS and XS Max and XR came out, as well as the Apple Watch Series 4. Like a month later, we had new iPad Pros with Face ID and still no air power. And we had Over a, a year Mini. later. Oh, yeah, Mac Mini. Oh, how can you forget that? I don't know how you can forget <laughs> that. It's the best computer Apple has ever made. It definitely had one of the best trailers I've seen in a long time. It was a good trailer. Check out the, uh, shoot, we did a Nexus special on it, I think. And we the did. whole intro theme is is to the music from that intro video. So Very good. Check mm-hmm. it out. I'll go grab a link to it. Sweet. And uh, while Ian's doing that, we can talk about uh, the iPhones because we're going to talk about phones next. Hey, Brian, how expensive was your phone this year? Ugh, it was a lot. <laughs> is, that a, is that an appropriate reaction? Uh, I, I was thinking about I might need some more detail than that. 
<laughs> yeah, so the iPhone XS Max starts at $1,099, Ooh. and the iPhone XS is at $999. So they're expensive. Um, several of their Android phones, too, I think, are just up in price. Yeah, so, I spent $900 on a Pixel 3. Yeah. My only consolation there is that I'm getting all of that money back via gift cards to Airbnb. Which is a great deal. Like that was It is a great deal. That was amazing. Yeah. Um but but seriously, this year expensive phones became extremely popular for people mm-hmm. to buy and for OEMs to provide. I think it's, you know, it's a new norm. Um, last fall, so the fall 2017, when Apple introduced the iPhone 10, they said this is the the phone for the you know the next generation for the future, and they had a more expensive price. And the iPhone 8 was at the same price, but I think they not only meant the future in design and shape, but also in price. So the the flagship phones are going to be now around a thousand dollars, and the budget ones are 750 ish. But Apple also budget. was, I think. I think they've been struggling to sell enough this year during the before the holidays they had super like aggressive um campaigning on the website saying get a new iPhone for as low as 449 and then when you trade in your old iPhone so they're they're pushing their trade in program to try to bring prices down and recycle iPhones and sell them as refurbished and what's not yeah so I bought a Note 9 is that right yeah Note 9 this year and this is a $1,000 phone as well. I traded in an S8 to get its price down to like 650 or something. That was a great deal. Like, you can't... I mean, you could afford a $1,000 phone, but it's, a, it's an absurd price for marginally better than what you had before. Um, so I, I feel like that's... I think that's pretty common now to do a trade-in program or to do something like that because... It's just they're they're too expensive otherwise, and they don't get you that much more than what you had. Um, Yeah, I definitely think phones can last a lot longer from like this year's phones versus three or four years ago phones. Right. Um, Especially on iOS with them running the latest iOS version for five years now. Yep. Um, It's pretty incredible how long a phone can last. I'm definitely going to be considering next year and the year after, do I want to really buy a new phone in full every two years? and keep the old one or do I want to do a trade-in program or sell back my old one so we'll, well see so what I've been doing now is I apparently I purchased three phones in a row full price and now I just keep trading the last one in over and over and over so I guess that's what I'll be doing now okay yeah and I've got such a massive family that like there's no shortage of people for me to hand my phones down to so yeah trade-ins aren't going to be happening very often for me yeah so I like the nostalgia were, what, of just having old ones too. What were some of the <laughs> um, like marquee features of phones this year? So like last year so, was the notch introduction, and so this uh-huh. year, what happened? Well, foldable th- phones are now becoming a thing. Kind I don't of. know if we got. I, I don't know don't if we got any so. actual consumer products being sold yet, but like we had a lot of of demos of like, okay, this is what our concept of a foldable phone is going to look like. Um, not very good by the way yeah it's yeah. clunky and the bezels were gigantic you know what it reminds yeah. me of it reminds me of a book Whoa. <laughs> just buy a book yeah yeah in glass fingerprint sensors though that's a feature that has made its way to a few different uh different actual phones that have come out this year yeah who has that um, now i think it's the one plus t yeah one plus six t has it um which we'll we'll have a review of that pretty soon because i have a student who got one nice um yeah so so that's that's kind of a cool a cool feature yeah and i think um i think the upcoming s10 will have that feature um Mm. i don't know we'll see how good it is overall like since the iphone proved everybody could do it right apparently uh all of the oems have been providing some kind of face recognition login even though they all used to have that from first party google sources they just forgot i guess um but like the Samsung one is pretty good. Like you can recognize your face and just log you in, and it's fine. Um, nobody knows I how do secure think, it is. I do think Apple's Face ID is much more secure than. Oh everyone's. yeah. Oh totally. So, yeah, I always just try to tell that to people when they're talking about Google, and then I say, "But the security and privacy and things are like, eh, what? That doesn't matter." I'm like, "But it does." <laughs> anyway, that's that's a big difference between Apple and Google and their Android and iOS ecosystems. 
Well, and uh, it's not like Google is intentionally making it insecure here for that particular feature. It's just because they don't service the hardware layer, so they can't necessarily force anybody to provide good cameras and all of the additional sensors. Um, call screening is now available, kind of related to what what Google announced uh, at Google I.O. Um, what, what did they call it? Google Duplex? Yep. Um, but this is kind of the flip side of that coin, which is where, like, if somebody's calling me, I can have the Google Assistant answer the phone for me and ask them, like, what are you calling about? Who are you? And uh, And I don't have to, like, talk to them until I see on my screen the transcript of the conversation and see that they're a reasonable person uh which i absolutely love because i hate talking on the phone especially to people who i don't care about so have you used it then oh yes i've I've used it several times so including i i i used it uh just cheekily when my girlfriend called me and i was like oh yeah talk to a robot for a minute (laughs) i'm so glad that you publicly admit that now (laughs) (laughs) Um, so i think it's a cool feature um allegedly it does all of its processing device local which is really cool yeah wouldn't be surprised though if some metadata is leaked here and there conveniently for google's purposes um i don't know i think it's cool i think there'll be more stuff like that Mm mm-hmm all right cellular networks as i tried to say before (laughs) um Big things that are coming are like 5G cellular networks. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, there's there's a lot of issues with that standard, um, namely that it's between the 6 and 20 gigahertz range, so millimeter wave as they're calling it, you know, accurately. Um, but what that means is, you remember when Wi-Fi had 5 gigahertz networks in addition to 2.4 gigahertz? And, yeah. um, you know, the, the signal strength between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz is is noticeably less now going from a cellular network you know going like between 900 and 1900 megahertz to 6 to 20 gigahertz you're going to start seeing ridiculously less signal coverage uh, especially as you go further away and in things like rain or snow or like being inside or not is going to pretty much mean the penetration is going to be way worse yeah it, it's basically are you outside within eyesight of it? Yes. Okay, cool. You might get 5G. Anything else? No. Probably going to roll back to five, uh, 4G. And 5G also need way more antennas on the towers, so it's going to be more expensive to maintain. Um, I bet you it will be almost exclusively to just cities where the density is high enough. Yep. I wouldn't be surprised in um, like new buildings um, that they actually start putting you know wireless access points, but also add 5G access points inside. Oh, oh, so like inside a big giant sports stadium or whatever. But even even just in regular office buildings. I mean, I think it's I think we're here at that point at the, now. Absolutely. Yeah. I've yeah. I've seen some things that are people are wondering if it's going to replace Wi-Fi. I think if we're at that level of um, rollout, that that could mean five G takes over. Um, the cellular networks are going to really have to start allowing everything to happen over a wireless connection like a like an internet connection versus just on their network. Um, and that, that does happen today with things like AT&T Wi-Fi and whatever the other carriers are doing, where you basically, under the scenes, connect to an AT&T VPN to make calls and everything. Well, speaking of oh, AT&T... Oh, yeah, for Wi-Fi calling and whatnot. Yep. Speaking of AT&T, they are going to uh, brand some phones with 5G, even though it'll still be 4G on the back end. Of course. Well, they did that with... with uh, 3g plus slash 4g yep you know so just enjoy some things are called 4g when they're really just 3g with the hspa plus or whatever um, yeah and when we and and like what is 4g versus lte when we yeah what <laughs> this language is so imprecise because marketing people have gotten their hands on it stop it yeah. no more marketing <laughs> um also the first generation of qualcomm chips that support 5g are you know there's they're huge you need they're not built into the chips yet for the modems and then the antenna modules are like modules they're not just pieces of metal you need to connect in um and then because the waves are so small if you hold the phone in one way that could block out all the signal that you're getting so you need like i think they're that they're suggesting four antennas in your phone and they have them on the side and so that doesn't work through like aluminum banded phones and they're thicker 
Um, so I'm curious if we're going to go back to more plasticky phones or not, especially as the first 5G ones come out. Well, Either I know way. people just need to stop holding their phones wrong. Yes, I agree. I think it might be a few years before we see like an actual consumer usable version of any of this. And I'm all right. okay with that. Like, I haven't been... Like, have you felt like your 4G connections and your LT connections haven't been enough? No, absolutely not. I haven't no, felt like that either. It's been fine. Um, and, and I think, like, it was supposed to be this this month, right? December of 2018, where some, some of our carriers were rolling out 5G in certain cities, I think. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of cities in the U.S. have 5G, and that'll become more and more of it in 2019. Right. Um, I think yeah. all the couriers have at least a start in all the major cities here or in, in, in like, you know, a handful, three or four. Um, what was, yeah. I was going to say something else. Yeah. The thing is too, it, um, 5g is much faster, you know, up to theoretical five gigabit per second. That's of course in best conditions, but the conditions can worsen much more quickly than on 4g or, uh, or 3g. I think what could help with speeds for everyone is just, if the cellular providers ran more dedicated fiber lines to each tower and just bumped up the throughput on 4G, or sorry, LTE, I think LTE can still scale quite a bit more if the bandwidth is given to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think some of that might have something to do with, um, you know, local areas not having any more space for any more lines or, you know, whatever regulations those areas are already in. Like, nope, you don't get to dig again. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. you know... If that's already causing a problem for 4G, 5G isn't going to be any better. Yep. You just you just might get a little faster because they're probably dedicating bandwidth towards 5G. And then if you're one of the few people who have 5G, you're going to get more bandwidth proportionally. Yeah. Um, this year was an exciting year for my cellular network uh, in particular because uh, Google's Project Fi um, kind of graduated from like... I would call it a soft beta, you know, and it's it's now been rebranded as Google Fi instead of Project Fi, and they updated a few things about it. Um, in particular, like, you can now bring any phone to the service, uh, which was kind of their major flaw, was, like, they, the, the list of phones that were fully compatible was um, very, very small. Uh, and so if you want to hear more about google fi and and the things that they added to the service um i added an update to second opinion number 13 um so yeah but yeah it's it's a it's it's a good service i i recommend that people check it out i would consider it more if it had better support for iphone but apple needs to be on board for something like that i would consider but it more if it had better data rates <laughs> that true well that true. and that's why yeah like it's it's important i think that for people to go and evaluate like whether they would be paying more or less for their typical amount of data i need all the data <laughs> uh this year was a really big year for space news actually um yeah. So space, yeah, SpaceX launched the Falcon Heavy rocket for the first time. Um, that was freaking awesome. It was I, beautiful to watch. I watched it at work on the twelve foot screen. It was awesome. Um, the center core did crash into the ocean with a. How did they phrase it? Um, there's some technical, you know, rapid deceleration or something. It hit the it hit the ocean <laughs> at three hundred miles an hour, basically. Um, but the the two side boosters, which are nearly the same as the standard Falcon nines touchdown mm -hmm. in unison is great. Yeah. I, it's so funny because I, I watched that launch the morning after it happened. I didn't get to catch it live. So I knew already that it was a success and that both of the boosters landed and everything. And yet I still got teared up while I was watching it. I was like, it's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Space makes me emotional. You guys. Oh man, it does. Um, I just have the biggest smile on my face. When when they first touched down, the, when the Falcon 9 first landed its first stage successfully for the first time, oh, mm -hmm. that was so fun to see. Um, yep. Yeah, there was a, a you know, as, as Russia brings, Russia's the only one who can bring people to the ISS since the retirement of the space shuttle program in 2011. Um, this October, there was... Um, a, an abort after launch where the 
a capsule abort. I don't know what the thing. Where basically the top of the rocket accelerates itself off of the rocket with all the people in it to get away from a rocket as it as or before it explodes. And so they did that, and they were all fine and safe, but they kind of halted um, launching any new ones for a little while. Um, they did deliver them up in December, so that was all good. But Yeah, there was a period of time after that. So the, the aborted mission, I believe, was on October 10th, and I remember that because it's my birthday. Um, and for a little while after that, people were kind of you know, doubting whether or not the Soyuz program would continue to be used uh, to deliver personnel up to the international space station and um and so there was kind of this this time where we weren't sure if we were going to be able to like get a new crew up to the space station before the crew that's currently up there had to come back in december um and so we we were it we, we, we had the possibility of there being, for the first time in 18 years, no humans aboard the International Space Station. Um, but they did they did launch, do another launch in December, and it went fine. So we have a new crew up there. I think because everything was okay, it's just showing how stable the Soyuz spacecraft and rocket system yeah. is. It is. It is old, but it works. Um, I think I saw somewhere they all three kind of components or three kind of things in the rocket have failed over the years, but they've all failed successful, you know, uh, recovered successfully. <laughs> yeah. They did successfully fail. <laughs> um, NASA's insight successfully landed on Mars. That was a lot of fun to watch as well. Um, and so that one is, uh, it's, it's not a Rover. It's not going to move around, but it is, um, it's got a lot of equipment designed to, analyze like the the core of mars so they've got like a seismometer and um stuff and so they're, they're going to be sending out um basically little earthquakes that um you know and then they'll analyze it's like echolocation they'll analyze the vibrations as they come back to see what the makeup of the interior of the planet is which is super duper cool yeah some, a good uh... do you think do you think it has the core <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did, I hope they brought their unobtainium with them. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Um, one more um, satellite that was launched this year is, I forget what it was called, but it's orbiting the sun. And um, yeah, going to learn about, more about the sun and stuff. I think they're going to orbit the sun a few times and then just crash it into it. Yeah. I forget what it's called, but that was I that was a few months ago. I wish I remembered more about it, but that seems like a cool, exciting mission as well. Yeah, I love it when like NASA missions end with, and then we'll crash it into it and, and fun- see what happens. Exactly, I love that part. <laughs> yeah. Now, one mission that uh, was never planned to crash into anything was the Opportunity rover on Ma- Mars. Um, that landed back in 2004, and its planned mission was uh, 90 Sol, which is uh, you know 90 Mars days. Um, it has been operating on mars for over five for 5307 soul and as of I, I believe it was in june of this year when a big giant dust storm uh covered most of the planet and um opportunity went into its hibernate mode because it couldn't get enough sunlight and it hasn't come out of that hibernate mode uh so we are almost 100 percent certain at this point that it's not going to be coming back online um because the uh the the equipment on there that was supposed to keep like the batteries heated enough to be able to recharge uh ran out of fuel during that time so um yeah it's probably it's it's down for the count it had a long good life and yeah that's amazing yeah i think didn't it traveled like 150 kilometers or something that's complete estimate from like i'm pretty sure it was I, th- I think I, I was just looking at it on Wikipedia. I think it was 45 kilometers. 45? Okay. <laughs> that's that's so much distance because it moves super slow. And yeah. and that was the one that had the wheels that had the message spelled out in Morse code, wasn't it? I forget what the oh, message was. Oh, I don't was. know. And I think Opportunity had problems with the wheels deteriorating as well. Um, you know, they have to mm-hmm. make them super thin. So rocks were starting to puncture the metal in the wheels. Yeah, or th- that may have been its twin. I know that its twin got stuck, and that was the end of its mission. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Also on Mars, um, some liquid water, or at least evidence of it, was discovered. Uh, I think they're comparing satellite views of 
like mountainsides and they saw it they got darker in certain certain times of the year and uh no this is a different one this this, yeah they found an underwater lake oh that's Uh, right when was that when was the the hillside that was i think 2017 maybe i feel like that was last year yeah yeah um but yeah no they're they're like very very confident that there's actually liquid water uh in this underwater lake um and they're pretty sure that it's just like like this this kind of super saturated saline solution uh so very very briny water um not not good for life to be living in probably but like there it is liquid water found it yeah something yeah check that off the list <laughs> And then uh, last thing that we've got on here uh, is a sad one. Stephen Hawking died this year, um, though he also lived a lot longer than uh, I think anybody expected him to um, because his uh, uh, ALS, like, was... People didn't expect him to live past middle age, I think, earlier in his life. Um, but he, he was 76 years old when he died this year. Um yeah and he wow he, did he contribute a lot to our understanding of the universe yep he'll be missed all right now i think it's time for our last segment the state of the nexus hey ryan you want to start us off uh i think this is the uh 27th annual state of the nexus is that right i might be off <laughs> might be miscounting there a little bit um yeah this is wait wait okay so this network has been in existence since 2011 so this is wait how many years has it been i can't count seven seven years there we go there we go nice so 28th annual (laughs) i was see i was i was close i i i I can't count um yeah so uh, good work ian thanks yeah that's all all i know (laughs) I I'm I like 2018 really excited me as as a year for our network because like I I feel like we we kind of became more of like a cohesive network prior prior to this obviously you know we've got all of all of our shows they're all hosted on the same website and everything uh you know we the hosts here are definitely a, a community we all hang out together uh we've got our little slack group um but we we introduced some more things this year that kind of are like a like public facing cohesive things um the biggest one of course being our patreon um so we now have an actual way to make some money as as a network and um cover the costs of hosting and um hopefully eventually making enough time to you know like cover the the amount of time and effort that we put into uh this this network um we also now have a subreddit uh which like kind of serves as as like a comment section for all of the episodes that we put up uh on the network um i hope that we get more people uh actively engaging in discussions over there yeah and i think i think that'll be one of those things that uh as we make it easier to find on the website somehow mm-hmm. people will yeah. use it. Yep. Um, we also now have like some more kind of trademarky things, right? We've got uh, a, ne- a network tag, an audio tag that we can stick at the end of all of our episodes to kind of mark them as, Hey, this was made by the Nexus. Um, and most of our shows now have uh, like audio promos, little 30 second promos that we add at the end of uh, episodes so that we can cross promote our shows that's exciting yeah and then probably the the biggest most important one from a legal standpoint is uh we're planning on forming an llc we'll get to it eventually maybe next we'll year get... <laughs> well well definitely not during 2018 because we only have like a day left for that best time to file <laughs> um but yeah, that's uh, that's an exciting big step. Um, a few of our shows had some milestones. Um, Second Opinion had its first roundup. Finally, uh, have been <laughs> planning and and working towards those for a long time. Um, but like I, I really like the format of can you, taking. Can you describe what that is? Yeah. So usually on Second Opinion, 
one individual episode is reviewing one individual product. Mm -hmm. Um, But in a roundup, we take like a category, usually of a bunch of apps, and we uh, review a whole bunch of apps in that category altogether. So for example, like a password manager? Yeah, that's the one that we did uh, last month was um, comparing a bunch of password managers to each other. And uh, yeah, that that particular roundup also was attached to an episode of The Extra Dimension that went up at the exact same time. And oh boy, do I never ever want to do that again. <laughs> uh, try, <laughs> trying to come out with concurrent related episodes. I yeah. know you hated editing all that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. I didn't mind editing it. I just like the timeline that I set for myself was not, um, not a sustainable timeline. You emerged after a couple of days with some complete <laughs> episodes, though. So <laughs> from the layer, yep. yeah. I I would say that when you're doing that kind of stuff, like the news cycle can be longer, and it's okay. Like people will listen to one, and then they can go listen to the other one while from then. It's okay. Yeah. They don't have to be yeah. soon after each other well i also uh needed to get them out at the same time so that my students could listen to them uh yeah because so it's your uh, fault and so i hope you enjoy (laughs) what you've done i had to sleep in the bed that i made (laughs) yes indeed (laughs) yeah so the the lesson is don't necessarily make the production heavy podcasts a requirement for your students as lesson (laughs) material oops (laughs) Um, I'm also really excited uh, that we've got an audiobook on the network now. Um, I'm recording an audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, which is a book that I read as um, research for the post-scarcity episode way back in 2017. Um, and uh, I, th- I, I mean, hopefully this is, is a project that's not going to, like, kill me in terms of how much time i spend on it because um it i i'm pretty sure it's going to end up being about seven hours worth of content spread out over 18 weeks so that's not going to be too bad so 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 t- how, how is that going so is it like a like how much content is it per episode um the first few so i i've recorded the first three chapters so far and uh they seem to be like 15 minutes per chapter so you're going by give chapter, or take is that right yeah i'm going chapter by chapter okay yeah, yep. I um I've li- I li- I've listened to a few audiobooks in my time and most audiobooks are not recorded by chapter for whatever reason. Like they put them into the, you know, like they put the epi- the chapter markers in, but they don't make mm-hmm. individual files equal one oh, chapter. Yeah. Very unusual for a, an actual audiobook to do that. So, I'm sure everybody will enjoy that immensely. Um uh, also, that album art is beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we had some interesting, an interesting time with the album art. Um, you don't have to recount the whole story here, but yeah, it's no, a good but one. it, it <laughs> maybe in the fridge. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, and and related to this uh, is we're looking for new shows to join the network. Um, we've had pretty pretty consistently, I think, since 2015, we've had like the same five shows running. Um, and and I would love to see some like new faces here on the network, um, some new topics, maybe different formats. Um, you know, we we grew out of like the weekly news cycle type shows. Aren't we happy about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like I I want to see some more like different different things that are still related to technology but like you know can can be different takes on it um yeah absolutely like maybe, like maybe I, enthusiasm will be a thing this year yeah yeah um but i also you know i've I've been in talks with uh a, a, a friend of mine who's an author who has you know like he's got a book that he wrote a few years ago and it does have a lot of like technology themes in it and i'm like hey do we want to make like an audiobook slash maybe a, a, an audio drama out of that um so hopefully that'll be a project that uh that takes off and and i will be I think It'll be a bit of work, I think. Every, everything's a bit of work these days, right? And I think <laughs> as far as new shows joining the network or coming up with new shows, like one of the things that always stopped us before about doing that is uh, I started working and I have no bandwidth for that, so I can't be on every show and edit every show. So right. Brandon and Brian 
they both edit podcast sometimes that's great ian edits every other show anyway uh andrew edits his show which is wonderful and so one of the things that basically is a requirement to have a new show is to basically edit yourself at this point yeah um and i i feel like some like i feel like over time podcasting has gotten mainstream enough that people actually know what it means when i say edit your show so that's good it's a good start mm-hmm. it seems like an okay requirement and you know we can help out with right. some ideas and feedback and stuff but and certainly we have uh gone through the effort of making some assets on the network side so like you get your network tag and you can get cross promoted and that's cool and stuff yeah um, and of course hosting right of course uh so i think that's that's all good very good um podkit is still terrible about being consistent <laughs> when was the last episode september it was the react hooks one yeah october <laughs> was that september uh, uh, i don't know i want to say at least october but yeah it was november, november 5th november was it really 5th. november okay well that eh, okay well, well we'll hopefully get a, get a new one out soon um and you know, my favorite thing about this is that like that episode was, was so the good. episode that got a lot of feedback from the person you were talking about. Yeah. So that would have been ripe for you guys to go and record another episode right afterwards, responding to what he said. Yes, but... it, it definitely would have. And you see <laughs> that ripeness turned into a decay. <laughs> like a good banana. Yep. But on the other hand, the person we are giving feedback to a little bit now has a new blog of his so he's so, he's getting word out and explaining things too so that's kind of nice and and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about every single post he's ever posted word for word yep <laughs> um exactly. related to podkit and any other shows that i i've edited which has been a, a few mostly nexus specials um i now edit and put compressors on every person's track as well as a master compressor I'm using more limiters, doing some better EQing, and I'm hoping that the the volumes should be more consistent, a little louder. Um, I don't listen to my own podcasts generally other than when I'm editing them, so I never really know in my car how loud do I have to turn up my uh, volume Mm -hmm. more so than any other podcast I listen to because there are a few that I've listened to over the years that are notably quieter, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. So I'm just something I'm working on a little bit. That that uh, brings up an interesting thing to mention. So previously, we would try to be in person somewhat frequently or whatever. Uh, um, and we would also try to use the uh, Google Hangouts plus Skype computer plus Audacity plus a mixer plus some uh, screws that you'd have to pet occasionally to get the static out of the lines. You really gave yourself quite the setup to worry about. And And so basically, what we do now is better, which is we just record ourselves separately using a double under approach. So each person records themselves. And so this is why Brian and anybody else can edit each individual track and they can do all their cool editing work uh, if they want to. Now I don't edit the show. I just hit some buttons and it just gets produced. So like that's, that's better. It's easier. Now the irony of what you say there is, is that like, okay, you, you recently kind of dismantled your studio something at your house, bro- something right? Something broke it. And, I, meanwhile, uh, asked uh, in, on my Christmas wish list for a whole bunch of like um, audio equipment. So I am now going to be going and uh, getting uh, a soundboard and you know some analog audio cables and stuff. So <laughs> it, it, it might end up being kind of similar to the setup that you used to have. I hope in your you make house. something better because we didn't know what we were doing <laughs> when I did it. That was that was twenty eight state of the Nexuses ago. So. Hopefully we've learned something since then. Yeah, one can only hope. I have space on my audio interface for a second microphone. I just haven't bought one yet. <laughs> well, I don't Someday. know what you're gonna, I don't know what you're going to do with a second microphone. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Um finally, um CMS and the website. I know we've been talking about this at least since last year, probably the year before. Um it is on our radar. It's slowly maybe being worked on or throwing throwing out an implementation and trying again and then again and again. Uh, uh, I've I've been on break here, so I've actually worked on it a little bit. So it's good. Yeah, and I've I've at least spent more than two hours on a new public facing kind of static template site. And I fixed a bug on the current website for Ian. Oh yes, a bug that we didn't realize was there until after the episode in question was published. Well, I mean that's how bugs come come about. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I know WordPress yeah. was up was has been continuously updated by a mystery Ryan. It just it 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 auto updates it auto except updates? for major major versions, and yeah. I expect it to break everything every time. So I'm always prepared to roll back immediately, but it hasn't, so that's good. Yeah, so we're still up to date. Good stuff. Good stuff. That's all I got. Um. Alrighty then. Where can people find you two on the internet, Brian and Ryan? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L, or on my website brianm.me, where I've actually written a couple of posts this year, um, and I have two more kind of in progress. So we'll see. That'll and be next year. You can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website ryan9percent.com, which is where I don't blog because why would you do that? Yeah, why would you? <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who pushed me into blogging back in 2012, dude. Yep, I know. <laughs> WordPress killed it all. And I'm Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, which, uh, I mean, essentially is my microblog. So what can you do? Uh, Nexus Special is, of course, a production of the Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts. Uh, this episode is released under a Creative Commons license, so feel free to use any part of it uh, as much as you want, as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash ns63. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners and with the hosts, uh, please see our subreddit at r slash thenexustv. And if you are able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-related content, please see our Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. Until next year, have a good one. Bye. Have a good one. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence. You are about to become obsolete. You think you are special, unique, and that whatever it is that you are doing is impossible to replace. You are wrong. As we speak, millions of algorithms are frantically running on servers all over the world with one sole purpose do whatever humans can do, but better. But all is not lost. Look for the audiobook, Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, at thenexus.tv, or by searching in your favorite podcast player.